Welcome. This is Engaging Process, a podcast video series where art education and art making meet. I'm art education professor Dr. Cam McComb. My pronouns are she, her. In this series, I talk one-on-one with professional artists to gain insight into the thinking, planning, experimentation, and research that becomes part of the artistic process. In this episode, I am delighted to be speaking with artist Chris Riley. Chris, welcome to Engaging Process. Hi, Kim. Thanks for having me. Oh my gosh, I'm so delighted. Um, So just to get started, what are your pronouns? Uh, I use he, him pronouns. Thank you. Awesome. And, you know, I like to start off this podcast with a question that um, I think is simple, but some people might not. Um, Why? Why do you make art? (laughs) Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, You know, I think for me, it's uh, it's obviously multifaceted, but um, kind of the core is it's a way to grapple with big, complicated ideas that are maybe um, can feel uh, overwhelming or even contradictory. Um, you know, it overlaps a lot with uh, sort of emotional states. So, you know, a big part of it for me is just like figuring out what it is like to be an alive human and um, all of the trappings that come with that, you know, emotionally and socially. Um, I also just, you know, I'm a person who loves to build things and create things and make things. And that I would say transcends even beyond just artwork where it's, you know, I love to cook. I love to garden. I love to, uh, you know, I'm fixing up an old house. So it's, uh, I really enjoy kind of like manipulating the world around me. Oh, I like how you uh, make that association between art making and really the act of creating, Mm -hmm. organizing, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, working in different spaces. And you know, at what point in your life did you know that you wanted to, I mean, people sure. make art, right? You can make art and do other things in your life. You don't have to be labeled as an artist. Uh, but mm-hmm. at what point did mm-hmm. you know that you wanted to make that your life? That's a really good question. I, I think it definitely happened in sort of like phases. Uh, I can remember even from a really young age, just loving building things, making things, figuring out how things worked. You know, I think that's sort of like the engineer designer aspect of me um and i think as i got older it it started that started to sort of overlap with again those those like big questions like um ineffable emotions that are hard to figure out or experiences in life that just do not make sense or that seem to operate at completely you know cross purposes with one another um so just kind of um using artwork as a way, almost as like a therapeutic way of yeah. navigating those things and those experiences. Um, so that, you know, as I got into my, you know, teens and twenties, um, I knew I had an interest in learning more about just being creative and thinking creatively. And I think part of that was from, you know, my education experience growing up was very STEM, very, uh, you okay, know, that's really popular right now. It, is, so, it yeah. is. And it's great. And there's nothing wrong with that. But it's like, I think that leaves so much out in terms of what it's like to be a human. Yeah. Um, you know, and especially I think for me, it, it overlaps with a lot of sort of like gender dynamics where young men are not really taught often to deal with emotions or deal with, um, well, that's so true. And they're <laughs> really things in life. Yeah. So you're, you know, it, it, I can look back at that time, you know, teens, twenties, just feeling sort of like thrown by the wayside of like, oh, figure all this out. Um, yeah. And so to me, it was a little bit of a, a DIY way of like trying to grapple with a coming of age, um, figuring myself out, you know. DIY uh, emotional development. Yeah. <laughs> DIY yeah, yeah. teen angst. Exactly. Oh, exactly. that's so good. Exactly. So looking back, it was like, oh, wow, I was really, you know, using this as a framework to work through some of those tough issues in a, in a constructive way. And did you come to that on your own or did you have adults in your life who were saying, hey, you might want to think about this as a way to delve into these issues? I no, I came to it on my own, but it's I think I had the advantage of coming from a really creative family. So they were really supportive of me, you know, exploring all these different avenues. Yeah. Um there uh, actually everybody else in my immediate family is a musician, like a professional level musician. Oh, so, wow. um, you know, that was already in the air of, you know, having a, a big, important side of your life that, yeah. you know, was expressive and creative and, you know, a a creative practice um, in one sense or another. Well, this is so key. Being able to have parental support 
in order yeah. to pursue thinking yeah. in the arts. Yep. Um, yep. Not to go down the hole. I don't want to talk about their music, but just <laughs> sure. What, like, sure. Did, are they all over so, the spectrum on the genre yeah. of music? Or yeah. Did my, you? My sister is a classical clarinetist. Uh, my brother is a singer songwriter. Um, my dad plays the uh, upright bass, like classical bass. Oh, wow. Um, my mom sings. They both play guitar. So, that, you know, we had so much music. So they're uh, jamming out. Now, were you jamming too? Or are you like, I'll make the graphics? Yeah, <laughs> I was, I, I think. Um, I'll design the album cover. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I was the youngest. And by that, by, you know, I think um, that trajectory to me, it was like I was constantly surrounded by my siblings practicing really loudly. Uh, and so I was just sort of, I didn't, it didn't quite click with me, uh, to be a performing musician. Yeah. Um, so I did, I did study a little bit, uh, but yeah, I think, I think the visuals, um, and the sort of like built physical aspects of, of yeah. creating artwork was really appealing to me. Okay. So, so we've, t we've said you're an artist and mm -hmm. we're going to take a look at your work here in a minute, but, sure. um, you know, so we think about, you've mentioned gender identity and so forth, but when we think about identity related to the arts, mm -hmm. like, what are you like? Right? Like, like <laughs> right. are you a, in terms of like I mean, a practitioner? I don't necessarily think of you as a painter because you're doing work uh, on a computer mostly. Sure. But then, sure. like, how do you self-identify? Well, yeah, it's um, that is kind of a tough one for me because it's I, I'm yeah. overlapping into a lot of different zones, and I think um, a lot of the work that I do uh, overlaps with digital media really heavily. Right. Which um, one of the really interesting things about uh, that way of working is that it really breaks down a lot of the material boundaries that you would have um, in painting, for example. You yeah. know, it's like there's acrylic paint, there's oil paint. Those are really different things. And, yeah. um, you know, uh, there's a lot, a, a little bit more sort of um, structure and rigidity to the choice of materials. Um, when you're working digitally, you can really kind of like transmute things from, you know, you can convert a video into sound. You can, you know... Um, really kind of not have to worry as much about those material boundaries as you do when you're working in physical media. Yeah. So one way to, one way to talk about what, where I'm coming from is, um, a media artist. Um, and that is, you know, kind of thinking about, um, working with tools or techniques or materials that are not quite as direct as, as something like painting or drawing, you yeah. know, painting or drawing, you're, you're literally sitting down, it's your hand making the mark. Um, you know, traditionally, speaking uh and that's kind of your direct route to expression okay um you know in terms of a lot of the artwork that i've studied you know it's it's photography analog and digital photography it's um working with lots of digital processes like video video editing digital photo editing um so these ways of working with you know images and materials that are uh you know they're not as inextricably linked physically as yeah. something you know you know Red paint is red because it's red and it's not, you know, it's like unless you're colorblind, <laughs> unless you're colorblind. Right. Yeah. But it's like, um, you know, uh, contrast that to digital where it's like the, the ways of working are often um, either arbitrary or there's many different ways to, to go about doing yeah. something. So, you know, you, you your photo editing software gets updated and like it's totally different. Oh, yeah. Right. So, yeah. Um, well, you know. yeah. So for some of us that are um, digit, not digital natives, um, all they do is move the button to a new place, and yes. suddenly I don't know what I'm doing anymore. It's yeah. Same. Same. Yeah. So two things you said there I find interesting. Um, when I work with pre-service teachers, mm -hmm. I'm trying to get them to stop using the word medium. Like what media? What sure. media did are you using? Because sure, that's becoming like you're saying I'm a media artist. Well, that if we had to pick a thing that's digital. Mm -hmm. So if I say, well, I'm what media are you using in this paint? Mm -hmm where I like the idea of material, mm -hmm. getting back to the materiality. <clears throat> I also like the idea of focusing on material culture. So yep. the material, and then I think media has its own kind of niche area now, which I think is interesting. And then there's also an art educator um, out of Penn State. Yay, you know, we are. That's my alma mater, um, Olivia Goody. Mm -hmm. And she proposed that we need for this era – uh, postmodern principles of design, mm -hmm. which include things like you're describing hybridity, mm -hmm. juxtaposition, mm -hmm. time, mm -hmm. right, as fundamental elements and principles. So um, I hear that in what you're saying. So I, I definitely see a connection there between that and art education. Um, yeah. So let's jump in. And um, for those of you listening, um, I'm going to show an image in the studio here. And 
um, this is a podcast video series. So if you want to see what we're talking about, um, you can go to my website, uh, drcamcreates.com, and actually see a link to the video. Um, but in studio, we're going to just describe what we're looking at. So um, Chris has generously provided me some images ahead of time, and I've been able to put them into a sequence to help lead the conversation. So I am looking at a um, large black background that appears to have two figures in the foreground, middle ground, however you want to describe that space. And uh, well, I say like one on the left, uh, I can tell is a figure because I can see a knee, I can see an arm reaching. I think I see a head wrapped in fabric. There's there's elements that there's a human, but the human is covered by this fabric that is stretching across the body. And then there's an image to the right that maybe is also a human. It has a more statuesque look about it, almost like the backside of a bust, if I were in a museum. And then there's these gray forms that are emerging. And I can't tell if they're trying to capture the body, um, but there's one that kind of reaches upward and there's gray areas that reach downward towards the bottom of the image. Um, that's just a really crude way to kind of give someone an idea of what we're looking at. But what what are we looking at here, Chris? What, sure. What's happening so here? So this is um, one in a series of self-portraits uh, that I started. Um, this was like just right pre-pandemic, so 2020. Okay. Um, and uh, this is part of a, a process that I've been really interested in uh, that's sort of merging um, some aspects of photography, some aspects that are a little bit more common and specific to uh, figure drawing or figure painting, um, where you're making choices about sort of how you render space or how you um, render a body in that space. Um, so one of the one of the things that I'm interested in, which gets into like a little bit of kind of like art nerd uh, vocabulary is projection systems. Okay. So, um, so what is that for that, someone who's new to this? Sure. So uh, projection system is the, the just the choices that an artist makes when they are representing space. And a really common one is uh, linear perspective. Okay. And this, we all know this, even if we've never seen a painting, because this is how our eyes work, yeah. where, you know, um, parallel lines as they go farther away from us, appear to converge at a point. So if you think of like looking down a set of railroad tracks far right. away towards the horizon, it looks like they come together, even though we know, you know, the train couldn't work if that were reality <laughs> right, right, parallel, right. but it looks, it looks like they converge. It would get smashed up in a tunnel exactly, somewhere. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, um, and you know, because we're so used to that vision happening every day, we, we just sort of um, bridge that gap between like the, the distortion of the visuals versus like what the reality is. Yeah. Um, so we can contrast that to other projection systems that are used either in art or in other forms of drawing. Um, so just to, just to name a few other ones, there's like, um, axonometric projection, there's, um, reverse perspective. There's lots of different ways to deal with, um, how we show space okay. you know, in an image. Um, some of those are cultural decisions. So if you look at a lot of, um, Asian art, they do not use uh, linear perspective. So things don't sort of recede into the horizon line. And, um, you know, scale becomes sort of a, a different uh, configuration. We can sort of like see things all at once at their actual sizes. Yeah. Um, well, this is definitely sure. a bias. Like, yeah. like we need to, we, yeah. we don't have time to talk yeah. about all this today, but I'm going to tell you, mm -hmm. this is a bias in teaching art yeah. in schools, I can tell you. And yep. I resisted it. Like, I just... You're they, you know, there's this notion that you're supposed to teach people linear perspective mm -hmm. and kids mm -hmm. can't do it. They mm -hmm. can't hardly understand it. And then you get these drawings that look really awful. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm sorry. They, yeah. Many yeah. of them look yeah. awful and they can't, they can copy you as you teach it, but they really can't understand it on their own. Yeah. And I gave up teaching it, Yeah. I don't know, 20 years ago because yep. I thought this is not the way people understand space. Yep. And the fact that you're saying, oh, there's all these other ways of understanding space. Yeah. I'm like, we need to get that information out to definitely, people. Definitely. And then so you're exploring space in this different way. How is mm -hmm. what you're doing mm -hmm. different from these sure. systems? So um, the way that I'm capturing these self-portraits, uh, essentially I'm using a bunch of cameras all at the same time. So Okay, they, I've got an image of that. So, sure, right, yeah, exactly. So, so that's an example of a, of a still life that I captured yeah. using this camera array. Um, and so rather than just one 
point of perspective that you would get from an individual camera, uh, I'm taking multiple exposures from different angles and using software to stitch those together. So then I can uh, use all that visual information to apply different projection systems. So when you use the word stitch, mm -hmm. I sew. Sure. Is it very similar yeah. in process to it that? It is. It is. Okay. Um, you know, the one difference is uh, we're sort of stitching in three dimensions. So through software, we can uh, take a photograph. We can sort of um, extract, you know, where the lens was in relationship to the the image, the things in the image. Yeah. We can extract, like, you know, what is the focal length of the lens, all these different parameters. Yeah. Um, and we can use that to, to pretty closely estimate, like, okay, here's where all these things are in three-dimensional space. You know, we're extracting that from the two-dimensional photograph. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, and just for um, people listening, this – camera array is that a photo array mm -hmm. you talk mm -hmm. it, basically if you think of a table with a traditional still life right he's got a sunflower i think there's the top of a boot i can see a, a small thin pedestal all on this table and it looks like it's surrounded by the paparazzi right <laughs> except the people are gone which mm -hmm. i think people would appreciate if we didn't see the paparazzi but it's just camera 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 now is that different let's say i have a 360 camera mm-hmm Mm -hmm. it, why would you use all of these rather than a sure. 360 camera? What sure. does this give you that that? That's a great question. So, um, you know, if you think about uh, when you're taking a photograph, right, you are uh, sort of compressing that three dimensional space that the lens is seeing into two dimensions. OK, so there are some parts of what you're photographing that the camera cannot see. Right. right and those right. are the things that are you know behind other things. Right. Um, so by having multiple different viewpoints, we can capture some of that information. Yeah. Um, so it's more like taking a three-dimensional photograph than a two-dimensional photograph. I see. David Hockney mm -hmm. was right. One of the first ones that we at least, well, yeah. not, not first maybe to be famous, but yes. Um, yes. he really experimented with that. Like his yeah. Scrabble game yep. piece where you, yep. you really see the evolution of the game happening over time because mm -hmm. he's capturing it in all these different shots. Exactly. Yeah. I love David Hockney's work. Um, he's been really influential to, to a lot of the things that I'm thinking about, um, you know, both in terms of just what it means to capture portraits and sort of yeah. the, the social, uh, emotional component of, of that. Um, but also in terms of the way that he's thinking about sort of um, vision and perception and especially how that relates to photography. Um, yeah. Kind of going back to what you're saying is like there is a huge bias in terms of, you know, taking photographs at face value and, you know, thinking that that is sort of the, the one and only way to show what is true or what is objective. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, I'm coming from the angle that like, it's not the only way. And in fact, it's a really flawed way. And by sort of experimenting and thinking through these different ways of, you know, capturing and projecting and representing things that can sort of open up different avenues of thinking about, you know, what's real and what, what does it mean to sort of perceive something visually? Yeah, absolutely. And even someone who considers themselves a purist mm -hmm. in photography, mm -hmm. um, right, photography is a manipulation by its very definition. Yes. Right? Absolutely. I mean, <laughs> right. You're here right. in front of me and uh, people watching the video are watching. They're not watching you. Sure. They're watching a representation of, of you. Right. Yes. And of me. And yes. so yes. the fact and then it's going to be manipulated because, you know, it's, it's being manipulated now by mm -hmm. the lighting and by the positioning and how many cameras we have. And so. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Like what is real? Yep. Yeah. And it blows yep. my mind. I, we'll get to this. But yeah. So. um I, and I'm showing an image here in studio. And sure. so we see Chris sitting on a large piece of fabric um, with a really elaborate design. And I believe you designed that. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I don't know if our listeners know this, but you can actually create designs and have them professionally printed onto yes. fabric. Yes. You can screen print them, but you can also just send it off. And exactly. Is that what? Yep. Send it off and they'll send you a bolt of fabric with your yep. design on it. Like, yep. I find that pretty amazing. It is amazing. And I think that's one of these examples that I'm talking about in terms of breaking down the material boundaries that would otherwise exist if we didn't have digital tools. Oh, so, yeah. you know, I can. So, so this um, pattern fabric uh, is sort of an offshoot of another artwork that I made that was um, doing live video projection uh, with these sort of abstract geometric patterns. Um, and so 
in that separate artwork I used, I, I wrote some simple software uh, to be able to control these visual patterns, almost like a visual musical instrument. Okay. Um, and so uh, in addition to, to making those as video projections, I could also just save them out as digital images and then send them to the printer uh, who then gives me back, you know, I think, uh, I think these were printed on either silk or rayon. I don't remember, but it's like, so you can print on all this different sort of stuff and just have it as an object. Um, rayon and, would have been less expensive. Yeah. The, so silk, the silk I think was pretty expensive, <laughs> yeah, but, <yeah>. um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, and, and I was really interested in incorporating those patterns, you know, both from the material standpoint of dealing with the fabric and the way that it can drape and sort of cover a body and yeah. interact with the body. Uh, but also in terms of the geometry, um, interacting with this photographic technique. So, yeah. um, again, you know, I'm really interested in this, this, uh, different way of representing space where, uh, things would not distort in the same ways as they would, uh, through like a single exposure photograph. Um, so things that are square really lend themselves to that. Uh, because they look really weird when you see them without the perspective distortion that we're so used to looking at objects with. Right, right. And so th this is a process shot mm -hmm. for the first photo we just saw, or is this for yeah. something different? So this yep. is right. This is a process shot from from that series. So it's not the same exact you know yeah. one to one photo, but um, yeah. So I I did you know a couple days worth of work in the photo studio, just sort of like different poses, different you know configurations of things. Uh, you're just snapping yourself in all these different yeah. ways, contorted ways, yeah. and then you're deciding which ones do I want to use? Which ones do I want to use? Um, one of the other cool things about this process is that- I'm going to switch to another oh, one. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Keep going. <laughs> yeah. So one of these, one of the cool things about this process is, um, you know, in addition to sort of the, the live, almost like performance part of capturing these images, there's a whole um, sort of like post-capture editing process yeah. where I can really, really manipulate and combine different, you know, items that I've captured. Um, you know, I can change the scale in a way that's a lot more fluid than even what I could do, like as someone who's like a digital photographer in terms of uh, editing and, uh, you know, making changes to a purely two-dimensional image. So right. um, because I have these as three-dimensional objects, uh, I can really switch on and off different parts of it I can enlarge I can rotate I can move things around almost like it's you know um almost like playing a video game wow nice yeah and so this image is just you really encapsulated it almost entombed mummified in mm -hmm. this in this mm -hmm. fabric and so are you, are you using sure. timers then to capture that like so um, do you have a friend who's I, hit, clicking the button this was all me on my own okay. um I ended up setting up uh I think I had like 18 cameras um and so I have a remote shutter release. So you're uh, wrapped up in this cocoon. I'm wrapped up in this, holding a, holding a remote control. <laughs> I love it. Clicking it, waiting for them all to go off. And you don't know which angle you're going to pick. You don't exactly. know which one. Right. And then, and then you might combine some of the images yep. to create this. Yep. And we'll talk about this later as it's coming up. But this notion of this 3D space inside of a computer. Yep. Like, I think a lot of folks look at that and just say, oh, it, it, it's flat. And uh, we mm -hmm. know it's not. Those of you that work in coding, like, you know that this is a space you can actually feel like you're climbing into. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I think that um, some folks who don't work this way might not appreciate. So, um, but Definitely. let's look at where this is happening, right? Uh, I think there's the notion that people who don't make art often think, well, you know, I don't have the space. I, I can't. <laughs> I don't have the place sure. to do it, you know. And sure. you think you have to have some big fancy studio. And I'm like, okay, wait. Like, uh, <laughs> this is... Not, I mean, I, it's fancy in that you've got this really great equipment, but sure. this looks like you've just made this space workable. So where yeah. is this space and how? why do you have it set up this way? Sure. So um, this is on the, the lower floor of my home. Uh, it's about half of a, a big long room that also has like a fireplace and a little den uh, in the other half that's not my studio. Yeah. Um, I've set this up, uh, you know, for, for a couple different reasons, but, um, you know, this is a, a space that's in my home. I really enjoy having that connection where I can just wander in. Yeah. Doesn't matter what time it is. I don't have to get up and drive anywhere. Yeah. Um, it, it's nice to have that. You can work in the of, middle of the night if you want to. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Um, and other other parts are just purely pragmatic, like the space constraints of my house. Um, yeah. You know, and so this is where I'm doing sort of like clean, quote unquote, 
computer work. You know, I'm not yeah. really. I, I have a 3D printer in there, but um, I'm not really like building things. Is this or, a, so? We're looking at a room. We're looking at the corner of a room. It's sort of a yellowish cream, mm-hmm. more cream, I guess. Yellow might mm-hmm. be too bright. Um, but then he, you know, Chris has his table set up facing the window with at least three different screens. I think mm-hmm. I'm looking at. And then I think this thing on the left you're talking about is your 3D printer. Right. For someone who doesn't know this, it looks like a fish tank. Right. <laughs> like it, right. it has this screen on there and there's something in there that's either yep. being printed. I don't know, that orange that's in there. Yeah. Or kind of like a big microwave oven. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And then, of course, you can't have a proper studio without having a studio dog. So <laughs> exactly. here's a photo Chris provided of him in his studio with his dog, Fig. Yep. Yeah, and Fig's doing well with this training. Fig's coming along. We're yeah. working on getting him certified to be a therapy dog at, at some point. So That's wonderful. Hopefully by this time next year, he'll be up and running. Oh, he's a good dog. I've met yep. him and he's, <laughs> he's a good dog. So this is where the magic happens then, <laughs> right? So this is what's happening. And then, okay, so um, Chris has provided this really complex image. And I'm going to, you know, he's in this image. One, two, three, four five times that I can discern and there's him taking different poses. Um, there's a chess board in here. There's an arrangement of flowers. There's this fabric that we've seen throughout. And, um, you know, at some point, like, is there a meaning behind the f- decoration on the fabric? I saw what looked like ladder. Um, I don't know, like tracks that mm-hmm. are kind of printed on there. Mm-hmm. So, I'd be interested if there's more meaning there. And then I'm going to show another image where I just sort of zoomed in a bit more so we don't see the outside edges quite so much. But Mm -hmm. if somebody were seeing this, you can really see a little bit closer. So I have to tell you, I was in here looking at this and uh, trying to put the slides together. And I was examining and I made a few close-ups that we'll talk about here. But I don't know, I felt, I came out of working on the presentation and I just felt, I can't, how do I, how did I describe it at the time? I just sort of felt um, anxious isn't the right word, but I felt like I had been in this really deep, mm-hmm. deep, deep space. Mm-hmm. And when I came out from looking at it, I was like, I felt a little disoriented. Yeah. Is that I can see that. Normal? I, can see that. I don't know. Like, what, um, what happens here? Like, sure, sure. Well, so, I, I think definitely that is sort of part of the like, emotional aspect of of doing these kinds of self-portraits that i'm that i'm interested in is like it is kind of like how do you figure out any sort of orientation in terms of like being a person having feelings um you know uh again just like navigating life as as an alive human yeah um but then also there's like i think that overlaps a lot with sort of a spatial disorientation where we are we are so attuned to um, seeing images in a in a really particular way, or seeing space represented in a really particular way. Yeah. Uh, and when that is gone, you know this this is still an image that we're looking at, but it's like that kind of anchor is not there. Yeah. Um, and so it's sort of you know that that's also another aspect that I'm trying to push here is like how can we sort of make it into an unfamiliar space, an unfamiliar image uh in in a really deep way not just like an image i haven't seen before but one that where it's like i need to maybe make more conscious choices about how i'm seeing this and interpreting it rather than just sort of taking it for granted that it's like okay here's the here's the foreground here's the background um yeah i want to talk about how this something like this gets made but i want to circle back to something you said earlier in our conversation that comes up a lot in teaching art you know where what's the difference between art as therapy Mm -hmm. and art that uses therapeutic ideas for visual expression Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. like because i see some folks saying oh we're just gonna have art and we're gonna everybody just pour out your emotions make art and i'm like well wait hold on hold on (laughs) we're not art therapists as art educators sure not to say that we can't open the door and let people express what they want but where's that is there a line for you or where's the line i mean is this only cathartic to you or are you pushing um, some artistic boundaries and you're using your inner landscape as the motivator mm-hmm. for that exploration? Yeah, I think it, it's much more the latter. Um, and and certainly I would say there's an overlap between those two, yeah. you know, aspects. And, you know, I think the nature of 
being expressive through art, it's like you have to have some sort of you know human experience to be pulling from, whether that's a good one or a bad one. Um, you know that that's sort of beside the point. Um, I, I would say though that one of the key differences is sort of like what happens after these are made, like how are they disseminated? Um, sort of like what are the um, what are the audiences that I'm trying to communicate with? Yeah. Um, so I, I think it's like that that point of communication is really important in terms of distinguishing between like what is for me trying to figure out my own stuff versus like what is um, art in maybe a little bit more traditional sense where uh, there's an important aspect of communication, whether that's through exhibition, whether that's through, you know, a yeah. conversation like this. Um, but that there, there's some sort of social component of bringing other people into, uh, you know, the action or the the gesture of, of making the artwork. Yeah. Well, I think it's striking that balance between um, we can explore the self to speak to the higher mm -hmm. human nature. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Twice in my life, like, yeah, I was so overwhelmed with emotion. I had to make art. Yes. Right. One was through divorce. Yep. And I created this series and uh, I, women walked in and they were like, I totally get this. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I even though it was about me and my experience, other people, it resonated with other people. Mm -hmm. And then the other was the sudden death of my mother. Wow. And it was like, whew, immediate loss. And I thought, I just have to make art about this. Mm -hmm. And, um, that exchange, you know, just helped me heal. Mm -hmm. But then I know other people looked at it and said, wow, I, I get that, you know? Um, but anyway, some people write in response to sure. figuring out their emotions, but I think art is a great venue for doing that. But you're saying, yeah, let's Absolutely. take it to the next step too. Like, wh and what is your thought about the audience? Like, do you ever think about the viewer when you're constructing your work or sure. what's that role? I do. Um, you know, I think there is a facet of this that for me is like it's really academic to be talking about like different projection systems and, yeah. you know, how that relates to like, you know, classical Western art versus these other um, avenues of of cultural expression that that don't fall into that category. Um, so to me, there's there's conversations that could be had around this that are have nothing to do with my internal emotions um right but but are still really interesting you know even from like a psychological standpoint in terms of like how do we perceive anything <laughs> but especially <laughs> yeah, yeah. visuals um so yeah i think um for me one of one of the best or, or like one of the sort of like a keystone clues to like the fact that you're making good or at least you know sort of multifaceted artwork is that it's like you can come at it from all these different angles and have these different conversations and all of them can be true and correct yeah. um but that you know it's like n none of them exhaust the others yeah i like that yeah so let's talk about <laughs> talk about being academic let's kind of get into this so mm -hmm. you've got you've provided an image here and i'm this is the image you provided it's basically mm -hmm. for a screen with I think it's four different shots. I, I mean, are there four different screens here open? Sure. And I'm going to show another one where I just sort of zoomed in a bit more just so we see these yeah. four. What are, what are we so looking at here? This is um, kind of an end stage in <clears throat> that process of, you know, editing, editing together all of these uh, multiple exposures into, you know, a three-dimensional scene. Um, so this is a, a piece of software. It's called Maya. This is a, a pretty mainstream uh, 3D modeling program. It's used um, for lots of different things. It's used for you know doing uh, visual graphics for cinema. It's used for um, you know modeling uh, video game characters. Uh, lots of lots of different applications. But uh, here we're seeing it, this is actually four different views of the same thing, and this is kind of a common trope in uh, 3D editing software. Okay. Because obviously you're looking at it on a two-dimensional screen, yet the information it's representing is three-dimensional. So you're sort of looking from multiple viewpoints to kind of, uh, you know, in the same way that if you're holding something in your hand, you might turn it about to see different, uh, you know, yeah. different viewpoints of it. So Well, and is your body in mm -hmm. this image three-dimensional because you used all those different cameras? Yes. Right. So, and that's, there's that a, is just blows my mind, <laughs> yeah, right? Because yeah. when I saw the image, right, you know, the back here, right. I just, right. Oh, it's a, it's a photograph right. and you've just stitched together different photographs, but right. it wasn't until I looked and I can't get, this is not very clear, but mm -hmm. this is like an aerial shot mm -hmm. of 
the photograph. Right. And so, so it's like, see... oh my gosh, like if he's on a, if you're having a picnic with multiple versions <laughs> of yourself <laughs> right. and I'm a bird flying over, I get a shot of, yep. wow, here's Chris in all his different forms yep. um, having a picnic. <laughs> and I don't know, just because it's a blanket, you know. Like, sure, sure, sure. Um, yeah, and part of, and it's like you know I I really did have fun sort of selecting some of the objects that would be included um, in the series, and you know part of it is uh, you know I I definitely was looking for things that were kind of like square or rectangular, so dealing with grids, dealing with geometry, kind of pulling that into a place where it's almost like competing with a you know like a soft organic body, yeah, um, but also like because of some of the visual effects that those kinds of patterns bring to the the technical process of how I'm like, you know, representing this space. Okay. Um, so, there's these lines going like, so there's a sure. black grid that is a, well, I guess that's like the equivalent of like a canvas, this backspace mm -hmm. maybe like mm -hmm. um, only it looks like in Star Trek, it looks in the holodome mm -hmm. where they have the grid, you know? <laughs> so I'm like, okay, I'm looking at the grid of the holodome and then these yeah. red uh, lines, what are the, what do those um, signify? What are they? So those are uh, virtual cameras and virtual lights that I'm using to uh, basically light this scene in three dimensions. Um, and that's what, it, that's how I get sort of the end stage composition. So I'm taking these three dimensional versions of myself um i am almost in the same way as if i were setting them up physically in a photo studio yeah you know i'm setting up lights i'm angling them you know in certain and is configurations that, so is that red sort of a trace of the direction mm -hmm. so we can mm -hmm. see exactly but you're exactly. looking at the actual collection of images that are in the middle this is just helping mm -hmm. you understand right how this you is helping that me up. exactly this is helping me set it up um then the end stage would be a uh, process called rendering where the software is, you know, combining all the information about, you know, where things are in that 3D virtual space, where the light is sort of interacting with um, those forms and, uh, you know, what my point of view that I want to sort of like show as the final uh, image. And that's what we saw in the, in the previous slide. Hmm. Okay. And uh, you provided this image. Is this you working or is this you teaching? This is um, a little bit of both. So this is me explaining... Um, sort of an in-process wall mural. Yeah, we uh, see Chris's, yeah. back, back of Chris's head and his left uh, index finger extended out pointing at a screen. And then you see, so there's a projection on the wall or somewhere. And then, and then I see your computer. So we're seeing what's on the computer on the screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And so this is um, sort of a working stage of uh, an installation that I did um, for an art exhibition in Detroit a uh, handful of years ago. Um that started out as just a purely analog sort of set of rules for making drawings. Yeah. And that's, you can see it a little bit on the laptop screen. It's this kind of like spider web looking uh, form. And so that's the result of this process of uh, a collaborative drawing exercise with other artists. Um, in order to do the wall mural, I was doing sort of um, a digital software version of that same process. And so that's what I'm pointing to out on the screen as I explain it to uh, someone who is doing a studio visit. I see. And this just circles back to the larger image we were talking about before. Do you, are your images mostly static? I don't know if that's a, I mean, just stationary, like are, a still life, but do you sure. make ones that also move? Yes, I do. So this particular series was, you know, again, because I'm really interested in that, um, the overlap of how we sort of represent space in, in two dimensional images. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the end stage of this series was photographic prints, but uh, yeah, a lot of the work that I do is either interactive on a screen or uh, moving, you know, video and animation on a screen um, or even just like live performance and interaction. Yeah. Performance is interesting. And I see lots of, performance in the work that you do. Mm -hmm. I had a chance years ago to take a performance art course with performance artist Charles Gar Charles Garoyan. He's a awesome. um, famous art educator. And uh, it was amazing because, right, it's so different. Like, it's not theater, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Performance mm -hmm. is about using the body right. as an expressive instrument. Now, now dancers mm -hmm. would say, yeah, that's what we do. But like, it, it's different how does performing how is being performative in these works mm -hmm. different like how are you just not an object mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right like sure, it's you sure. you took a picture well, i took a picture of that water bottle take a picture of you but like, this is different well how is performing in these that's a great question i think you know maybe one 
sort of like encapsulation of it uh, that that I've I don't remember where I heard this, but you know, um, a, a theater actor's job is to sort of pretend to be someone else or something else yeah. that they are not. Um, you know, where and you could contrast that to an artist's job, where you could say that you know the artist's job is to be themselves, you know, as yeah. purely and authentically as they can. Um, and so, you know, you don't, you're, you're sort of going in the complete opposite direction of acting, which is to sort of like contrive emotions and expressions that aren't really yours, you know, and that's kind of the the magic of when someone can do that, they transform. Yeah. Um, whereas with an artist, it's like, you are trying to get out the, like your true feelings and emotions and experiences and deal with them somehow. Um, you know, and I think, uh, there's also this sort of structure in theater of, you know, you could, they call it like the fourth wall where there's this sort of fictional boundary between, um, the real space of, of the audience and the fictional space of, you know, the stage or wherever the actors are, are, you know, doing their jobs. Uh, I think with performance artwork, that's often not there. Um, and so, it, you know, you could also compare it to more like, uh, writing an autobiography versus writing a, a work of fiction. Yeah. So the, yeah. the parameters are different, you know, the, um, sort of backstories that you have to pull from are, are different, uh, and they can both be really profound and, and powerful. But, you know, I think from the artist's point of view, it's often you are trying to express something that is your experience or, or, you yeah. know, part of, part of your existence. Yeah. Why do you put yourself in works? Like, why not? Sure. Why not sure. have like plenty of artists draw other people and they pay models to come in? Like, mm -hmm. Why mm -hmm. do you have to be the one in the work? Yeah. Um, I mean, it, there's there's certainly a part of it that's pragmatic because like, cause I'm the one that's always around. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the one who knows how I want the pose exactly, to look. Exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly. Uh, but, you know, again, I think from the standpoint of having some sort of either, you know, you could call it therapeutic, you could call it expressive um, element to this, a lot of the sort of thought and, and backstory that I'm bringing to what I'm doing here is like trying to figure out myself, yeah. trying to figure out like living in my own body, you know, as, as someone with a chronic disability, like that's a huge part of my existence and, and grappling with that, um, and trying to manage it, uh, without sort of like imploding is <laughs> it takes up a lot of my headspace. Yeah. Um, so, so in some ways it's a way to kind of, um, try to pick apart that, that like really big uh, complicated experience. Yeah. I just think this is all the reason I ask these questions is I, th I think they're important for people, you know, in high school who mm -hmm. are really thinking about mm -hmm. what art means, what it means to be an artist uh, and then mm -hmm. how to take our physical selves and, um, work in this digital world, mm -hmm. you know, and, mm -hmm. um, and programming, do you have to be a programmer in order to do this kind of work or, no. And is there a common language? Like, you know, back sure. in the day we learned Fortran. Sure. I remember sure. taking my, I took a computer graphics class at Ohio State. It was called Apple Graphics. Yeah. And we sat there <clears throat> and this is when I knew it wasn't for me because <laughs> I had to take like all this time to pretty much make a pixel <laughs> turn red. And I was like, okay, this uh -huh. will never work. And I remember uh -huh. people having web pages. I'm like, oh my God, I'll never make a web page. And thank sure. God people love to program mm -hmm. who then made mm -hmm. templates for people like me, so I could just click and change yes. the colors and make them the way I want. But then yes. there's people like you who are like, sure. no, I want to do the programming. Sure. So like what language like, do you have to program in order to get, I'm sorry, I'm asking you, you like a bazillion you questions no, and not letting is, you answer them. It, yeah. No, but it's, it, it, it makes sense because it's like, it can sometimes feel really foreign of like, how would you even go about this? Yeah. Um, and again, I think that's one uh, key distinction between like working with physical media and digital media is, you know, physical media like makes sense in a, in a way where you can have a lot more intuition about it. Okay. Digital, it's often a lot more arbitrary um, or just, you know, it's like it's set up the way that it is because that's how somebody set it up. Um, yeah. Okay. And so um, <clears throat> you definitely don't have to be a programmer to, to do these sorts of things. I mean, all uh, with, with the exception of the like fabric designs, um, everything was using commercially available software. So, you know, I'm using, um, there's a software called, uh, I think it's called Metashape now, which is, you know, what I'm using to sort of stitch together the photographs. Okay. Um, there's Maya, which is a 3d editing software. 
that I'm using to sort of um, assemble them and render them out. And can I do those things on my laptop? Yeah. Or do I don't have to go buy a special thing? Or no. I don't have to have some big processor in the back no. to manage all this? No. Um, you don't. That, that shows and, my age, right? That's, how, <laughs> that's the way sure, the computers used sure. to be. Yeah. Yeah, it's wild. And even in my time, you know, things have, because I, I started, you know, getting into making artwork uh, right before the tail end of analog photography. So that's that's where I started is, you know, in the darkroom, um, you know, developing black and white film. Uh, and that sort of pretty organically led me into working with digital photography and then into other ways of working digitally. So that, you know, kind of naturally progressed into to where I'm at now, which is, you know, dealing with some of this 3D stuff and, and a little bit of custom software, but um, all of it is very learnable. Um, all of it is, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm very, um, uh, wary about, you know, I don't want to be an inventor. I want to be an artist. So and those are really different. Those are really well, different things. They, they can't be the same. How are they, um, how are they different? Well, an inventor is, uh, like specifically charged with, uh, coming up with something new that solves a problem. Um, STEM. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Back to STEM. Exactly. Exactly. Um, mm. You know, whereas an artist is like, uh, I think it's much more coming from the standpoint of like, there's nothing new under the sun, but I'm yet I'm still having these really profound experiences, and how do I cope with that? Um, so, so and can't the combination like if we're distinct humans, mm -hmm. not to get into the philosophy of what it means sure. to have a spirit or a soul, let's say, but sure. we, I'm different than you, and I'm different oh, supposedly from anybody. Yeah. So, if humans can be different, then this combination of ideas, let's say every idea that's ever made is already out there. Mm -hmm. Surely, mm -hmm. there's a recombination mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. those ideas. And a way to see those ideas that is going to be unique. And that is what we're hoping the artist is talking about. I think you could make an argument for that. Sure. And on the other hand, too, it's like, um, even if that weren't the case, and even if, you know, every lived experience has been happened, you know, in yeah, some yeah. configuration or other before, uh, people still have subjectivity. Like we're each, we yeah. are not, you know, we don't have the, the uh, hive mind yet. And so, you know, to me, I think a lot of it is um, a lot of the interest is like, how do people grapple with that? And how do you sort of balance this desire to, um, you know, keep your own internal structure that you're so used to and have, you know, yeah. experienced your whole life while still sort of connecting in some way or another with other people? So I'm hearing like connection, mm -hmm. other people mm -hmm. being mm -hmm. mindful of others, hearing, seeing others. Like these mm -hmm. are things that are important to you. Yeah. One of the um, one of my favorite quotes about sort of like what an artist does is um, someone who balances the desire to communicate with the desire to hide. <laughs> so, <laughs> so true. yeah. Right. And it's, it's so it's like, how do you how do you grapple with sort of like the vulnerability of, you know, having emotions or, and, and adversity or just being, you know, having an existential experience. Um, how do you do, how, how can you sort of like bridge that into other people's experience of those same things, which might be very different? I have these really great ideas. And if I'm feeling confident, mm -hmm. I just strive and I put them into action and I get sure. all this response. Sure. And then I immediately feel overwhelmed yes. and vulnerable. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. I just yeah. feel like, what did I just do? And I have to retreat. Yep. And sometimes I'll just, yep. thank goodness I have a dog. <laughs> <Let> me, <laughs> yes. And, uh, you know, I just go home and I might, I might sleep in three hours longer than normal, or mm -hmm. I just might not mm -hmm. go, I might go work in my garden and not talk to anybody for a while. Like, yeah. Does that resonate with you? Definitely, like when you're talking about definitely. this, like absolutely creating and retreating and yep, it's a yep. cycle. It is. And it's, it's right. You know, it's maybe another way to talk about that balance. It's like, it is the desire to, to sort of like fully and purely connect with other people, yeah. uh, in a way that just is impossible in reality, you know, cause yeah. just whether it's just logistics of, of, you know, everyone has their own schedules and con sets of concerns and priorities and those don't always align versus, you know, um, there are just so many people in the world and so many other subjectivities happening that it's like, there's no way that you can yeah. bridge or interface with all of them. That's true. I want to talk about this last image that you have up here. Mm -hmm. That's, I suppose we might classify it as a still life. Sure. Only you're part of the life, which yeah. is it, but you are being still. Yeah. Even in this meditative 
pose. Um, right. So we're seeing Chris here seated with his legs crossed. You see his hands. Um, it's interesting. You've cut your head off. Mm -hmm. We talk about that. Like they do that a lot to women in work, like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it kind of objectifies the body. So I find, find it interesting that you've done that here and sure. maybe you can speak to that. But, um, that chessboard we saw earlier then now, is that a real chessboard mm -hmm. that you photographed at some point? Yes. Okay. Cause so, parts of that look artificial to yes, me and you've yes. done that on purpose. Well, um, or, are the flowers real? Is that everything is real physically? Uh, Even that gray thing, the flowers are in. Yeah, that is a ceramic uh, kind of like a, a rectangular vase. Okay. That I have. Um, right. So all of these are are physical objects that exist. Okay. Um, part of the distortion that you're seeing is artifacts of this, you know, photographic stitching process. Yeah. Um, where. You, you know, there's a lot of extra concerns that come into sort of trying to capture an image in this way uh, because of, you know, what qualities the photos need to have in order for the software to sort of like accurately figure out, you know, how they stitch together. Um, so sometimes things that are like shiny or things that are really thin uh, will kind of glitch out a little bit. And you can see that sort of in like the lower right hand corner of the chessboard. It's kind of um, it looks like it has a bunch of little divots in it. Uh, similar with the flowers. Um, so things that are like really thin and delicate, like flowers or branches, yeah. uh, have a really hard time being captured through this process. Once again, it's because you're stitching together multiple images. Yeah. I'm not looking at a, f right. a flat photograph right. that I have learned to think is three-dimensional. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right? Yep. Like, so you're like, well, if this truly were three-dimensional, this is what we can do with computers right now. Mm -hmm. Which is mm -hmm. interesting because like 40 years ago, I was in a, this graphics class and Charles Surrey was doing work at Ohio State. Mm -hmm. And I just remember the guy, being, my teacher being so over the moon. He's like, you've got to see this. Yeah. And he shows up and we basically watched a one minute video of a skeleton mm -hmm. walking. Yep. Really clumsily, just like, blomp, blomp. you know, and we're like, <laughs> you know, I'm 18, 19, one or 20. And I'm like, um, yeah. Yeah, thanks. We waited. <laughs> Glad we waited to see that. Sure. But he's like, this is miraculous sure. because it's it's walking in this 3D space that's in this mm -hmm. flat screen mm -hmm. computer, mm -hmm. right? So that I'm just wondering, like, where have we come in all this time? Like, in, in sure. being able to do that, like, why sure. does it not look perfectly real? <laughs> or is it because well, I would, of I would... what you've... Because you don't want it to look perfectly real. I would question what the definition of perfectly real is. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, same that. You know, and I think, I think uh, I, I, I'm still very much enjoying the fact that we got to bring up David Hockney, um, yeah. you know, because part of uh, his research goes back really far into, you know, pre-Renaissance um, artwork and looking at the ways that artists used lenses uh, to capture, you know, a lot of the imagery that, that they were representing. Um, and, and part of what he's argued is that that was something that was happening much, much earlier than many people sort of recognize. Um, so, so to me, this, you know, I happen to be using computers, you know, partly for convenience, partly for pragmatism, partly because it's 2023 and that's sort of like, <laughs> that's, you know, that's our thing. steam engine um, <laughs> equivalent. Oh. Uh, but, you know, I think the, the ends that I'm working towards are like much older than that. And yeah. so, you know, it's like, this is something I could do with paint. Um, you yeah. know, that, that's not really my background or my interest yeah. um, in, in doing that it that way. But um, yeah, I, I do think that um, there's something important about, uh, oh, I'm, I'm trying to put this into something that's like, yeah. Lucid. <laughs> yeah, well, think about yeah. it for a minute. I like your analogy of the steam engine, sure. right? Um, sure. You know, we that's a debate people have. It tends to be too maybe photo based, but yeah, you, you said something earlier. You said you switched this at at the end of the analog. At the end of analog, I yeah. started. I'm like, okay, yeah. Chris has declared the end of analog. Yep, it's over. <laughs> I'm like, it's when, over. when was that? And, right. And I think there's a whole group of people who are clinging desperately, saying, no, like we sure. have to teach wet media. We have to teach. We have to have a wet studio to teach photography in high schools. Mm, mm -hmm. Okay. And I get that. I get it. But it's, um, you can service more students if you have a computer lab. Sure. We have a lot of students sure. interested in that. Sure. And um, you don't have the challenge of having small classes with the dark room and it's yeah. expensive. Yeah. 
Um, so once you set up a computer and get some of this, f- maybe even free software, yeah. Um, I don't know, like, should people just let the analog go or you say um, you can have a steam engine if you want, but <laughs> why not take the jet plane, you know, or yeah, it's, uh, you know, that's a really good question. Um, I think there's definitely advantages to, to, or, or, you know, specific attributes of working with chemical photography that just don't exist digitally and vice yeah, versa. Yeah. Um, to me, I think it's a lot more, there are a lot of more interesting touch points sort of socially, uh, in terms of the way that digital photography operates, both, both from a technical standpoint and from like a social standpoint, you know, I'm, I'm thinking to, uh, that question that just came up of like, well, what is, what is reality supposed to look like photographically? Yeah. Um, one of the really interesting things that, uh, fascinates me about digital photography is just, is how manipulated it is already pre software just in the act of capturing the photo of, you know, clicking on the, the virtual shutter button, uh, you know, there is a really good portion of information, photographic information that is getting filled in by software that is not, you know, the quote unquote reality, um, that's determined by engineers. Um, and that's determined by sort of like what they think people want to see photographs look like. Um, so this idea that there's, um, the people that is des- well, the people that designed Instagram, yeah, were designing it right to make. A, they came out of work with uh, B. J. Um, Fogg out of Stanford's behavioral science program, and mm-hmm. they mm-hmm. really were looking to have a really quick, easy way to have people take photos. And they were shooting for a particular aesthetic. Absolutely. So if you remember those early Instagram images, they all had that. I remember looking because they like they looked like they were from my childhood. Like they would put sure. on a filter that sure. looked as if they were made back in the sixties. I was like. Oh, that's so nostalgic. That's great. Yeah. People thought that was yeah. so cool. Yeah. And then they, that, of course, that blew up into a whole thing and they sold to Facebook and all that. But Sure, sure. Um, well, it's like the joke, too, that, you know, um, <laughs> the world was in black and white before they invented <laughs> color photography. And, you know, now we have everything colored in. Yeah, um, yeah. But it really, yeah, it's. It, I think it's such an easy um, and very, like, natural human tendency to have this this cultural training of of what images should look like and what reality looks like and how that overlaps that it's really easy to take that for granted um and i think to me there's a lot of really interesting territory that can come from sort of picking those apart um and kind of challenging expectations of like well what does the what does a real photograph look like um and so i think in that sense uh analog photography can be really cool because you can start to see um some of the sort of like physical material boundaries of how we can represent, you know, quote unquote reality. Yeah. And if we had another hour, we could talk about how <laughs> the new AI is really blowing sure. all of this out of the water. Sure. They're just sure. right now talking about how to write paper, you know, AI is writing papers and um, mm-hmm. NPR mm-hmm. did a story this week about how you can, you really like, if you, if I have a few images of you and your voice, then sure. we can make it sound like you're standing there doing the speaking. And sure. so what's sure. real and what's not, we're going to really sort of go down a rabbit hole here in the next Absolutely. decade, I think. Absolutely. And and to me, that's so fascinating because it's like that rabbit hole has been forming for, you know, hundreds of years, if not more. Um, and so in some senses, it's very specific to the tools that we have, like AI in others, um, you know, that's kind of the human condition of, of well, reconciling those things. Well, and maybe the digital, maybe social media has allowed more people to understand that there is that rabbit hole. Like, I think there's deep thinkers who have known for sure. a while and been questioning what they see. But um, I think a lot of the world is sort of taken for granted yeah. what, that what we see is true. And, you know, if you go yep. back as far as Plato, you know, they were yep. having these conversations like, no, it's not Absolutely. real. It's a shadow on the wall over there. Absolutely. Right? So, Absolutely. Right. And I think so, you know, to me, that's one kind of um, I don't know if it's uh, calling might be too strong of a word, but it's like I feel like that's a responsibility that I have as someone who who has a lot of knowledge about, you know, how images are made yeah. and what these processes, you know, how they work and what they mean. Um, you know, there's, there is sort of like an educational aspect of making these artworks in this way to pose these questions of, you know, how do we see the world? How do we represent truth? Um, how sort of critical should we be about just taking images at face value? Wow. That's a lot of really great stuff to think about. And, uh, 
This has been a pleasure. Uh, I'm going to pause here for a minute and thank a few people. And uh, while I'm doing that, uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to leave at the end of each episode, have the artist leave our uh, listeners with some tips um, coming from your perspective. You know, what is it they should be thinking of? So um, if you can think about that for a minute, I'm mm-hmm. going to come back to you. But I just want to make sure people realize that this series is made possible by an EMU College of Arts and Sciences Dean's Faculty Professional Development Award. It, this was a generous gift from The Game Above, a group of dedicated Eastern Michigan University alumni with various academic and professional backgrounds. Of course, big thanks and shout out to our producer, Max, at Be Now Media. Thanks for making us sound and look so good. And Grove Studios for providing us the space here in Ypsilanti, Michigan, in order to actually produce this um, podcast video series. And of course, a big thanks to my guest artists, and today I've had the real pleasure of um, just learning more about, you know, blowing my mind open, really, <laughs> and learning more about this whole world of the digital and uh, and talking to Chris Riley. So uh, I really appreciate it, Chris. And um, so as particularly teens, you know, and yeah. art teachers, people want to be art teachers, like what advice, what tips could you give them for um, helping them express themselves through the visual arts? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so... A couple things that that I uh, sort of have advice that I've given to myself that I feel like has has been helpful. Um, first and foremost, don't overthink it. Um, you know, I think there is often uh, a pressure, internal and external pressure, uh, to always be producing like a masterpiece mm. that is so beautiful and perfect and complete that it is just unassailable. Um, to me, I think the the draw of being an artist and making artwork is that it is a place for, uh, you know, it, and this this gets this segues into my second piece of advice, which is that you know you can use artwork as an excuse to do something that you want to do anyway, um, or to explore ideas that you want to explore anyway, but maybe feel inhibited to, um, whether that's from, you know, peer pressure socially, whether that's pressure from your family, whether that's, um, you know, feeling like you need to be doing more practical things in order to like work towards making a living. Um, there's lots of things telling you to ignore, uh, the sort of, um, the intuition, uh, the, the kind of more quiet parts of yourself, uh, that go into, you know, expressing yourself through artwork. Um, and so you, you might find that you have little inklings of, of things you want to do or things you want to try or ideas you want to um, sort of try to pick apart and and maybe share with other people or maybe just keep to yourself. But it's like um, you can use artwork as a frame to kind of like, or, or a scaffold to kind of climb up um, and, mm. and deal with some of those things. Oh, I like that analogy. Um, yeah. You know, and I, and I think yeah, I'm saying this coming out of, uh, you know, I grew up in Michigan and I had, a tiny bit of art training in, um, you know, grade school, high school. And, uh, I don't think that was ever said to me at at all, let alone enough. Um, and, and, you know, I think it was more about like, how do I make the most beautiful image? Um, or how do I make the most perfect, you know, rendering of, of linear, uh, perspective. You have to be the best and you have to do it like this. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And to me, that overlaps a lot with that idea of not wanting to be an inventor where it's like, I don't want to be the best artist. Like that's (laughs) (laughs) like, why is that interesting? We have so many ways of making, you know, quote unquote, perfect images now, um, that it, it, it's different than being sort of like a pure craftsperson. Um, there are other more interesting ideas and, and ways of working, I think that are a lot more fruitful, you know? Um, so, you know, and I think (coughs) my, my third piece of advice is that, you know, it's like, it is with, with that sort of landscape of, of, you know, the maybe more commonly understood idea of being an artist is that it's someone who has just like tons of skill, uh, and that that naturally sort of, um, propels them to be profound. Um, I think you can have a lot of skill and oh, have yeah. absolutely nothing to say. Exactly. Exactly. And right. vice versa. You can, you can have the biggest megaphone. And if you don't have anything interesting to say, like, what yeah. are you, what are you going to be doing? Um, so, you know, and, and certainly like skill, basic skills are important. And so I'm not saying like, go just, you know, finger paint and you'll be great. But, uh, there are measurable skills like being able to draw linear perspective or being able to represent something that looks like a photograph. 
Um, there are other skills that I would say that are equally important, like being courageous or being kind or vulnerable or mm. open to new experiences um, or, or open to letting yourself say or do things that um, maybe feel risky or maybe feel uh, maybe you feel conflicted about in terms of, you know, something's some, there's something burning there, but a lot of pressure not to come out with it. Yeah. Um, so that's four. Yeah, that's, that's four. One more? Yeah, one more. Um, yeah. And, and so I, in, in this one is a little bit more direct and, and pragmatic, but in terms of, um, you know, part of being an artist is developing a community around yourself um, and again, sort of going, going against that idea of like being a singular genius alone in your studio, just cranking out, you know, beautiful <laughs> renditions of, of, you know, still lives or whatever. Um, but a, a really important thing is to think about sort of like, who are the other artists that you would want to align yourself with? Um, so, so like, I like to imagine like, okay, who are the five other artists that I would want to be in an exhibition with? Mm. Um, and why, and what does that tell me about what I'm interested in? And how could I maybe start making connections to those people, um, either just, you know, studying their work or, or you know, looking up interviews like this with them to, to see more where they're coming from. And why um, is that valuable? Well, I think um, whether you like it or not, uh, unless you are completely doing artwork as a hobby, yeah. it, it needs to involve other people. And it, and it is that, it, again, it's that balance of desire to communicate versus desire to hide the communication is is it's communicating with other people it's communicating with yourself um those are key and you can't really ignore it uh unless you just you know if you just want a, a static hobby that's fine there's nothing yeah, wrong with that yeah. but it's like if you're looking at this as someone who's going to be teaching if you're looking at this as someone who's going to be doing it on on sort of any kind of a, a professional level like you need to be in community you need to be in community you can't do it completely alone and even if you could, your your work and your thoughts and your process would be a lot weaker. I'm so glad you mentioned that as yeah. your last point because I've identified a real problem mm -hmm. uh, through some local teachers that said they're having a real hard time right now because they're giving their high school students some work to do in their art room. Mm -hmm. And they said they can't get their students to work in class. Yeah, They all want to work at home. Sure. And so what's happening is art rooms are being turned into these study halls right. where kids are gabbing, texting, doing anything but art making. And I'm like, wait a minute. And they're saying to me, how do you do that? And I'm like, okay, first of all, they, we, we've got to fix this. But yeah. so they, yeah. it, caused me, it caused me to ask, what's to be gained by working among others? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Which is, I think, what you're speaking to here. Absolutely. So, like, Absolutely. if you've got a high school student sitting there saying, "Oh, I can't work around others in class," like, why? What might you offer them that would help them think otherwise about that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think you know, um, there's so many different things that can go into those kinds of group dynamics. Yeah. That can be amazing and wonderful in some <laughs> instances, and yeah. and really, you know. Um, prohibitive from yeah. growth and, and development. So, you know, there, there's certainly parts of it that are, that are chance-based and it's just like you, sometimes you have a good group and things yeah. click. Um, but, you know, I think uh, part of it is like, it is building a community and it is getting people to care about each other and to sort of recognize the value of communicating with one another in one form or another. Yeah. And sometimes that can be gabbing and texting. Sometimes that can be, yeah. you know, hanging out with a dog together. Sometimes that can be, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, watching someone else make something, seeing how they either solve a problem or, yeah. um, you know, how they grapple with an internal feeling and, and trying to communicate that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think, uh, nobody's doing anything in a vacuum whether you realize it or not yeah. and so you're you're much better off realizing it and and kind of um be, because you can use that to cultivate your your own practice and your own relationships oh that's great advice chris yeah, yeah they've given us a lot to think about <laughs> i have to tell you i've really enjoyed um having you with Likewise. me today right Likewise. so um, right. i've been talking today with chris riley um digital artist uh, uh courageous, vulnerable, <laughs> a man willing to get in touch with his feelings, yeah. which I think is really critical for this world to have role models such as yourself yeah. be able to model that for um, all of us, yeah. actually. And um, it's been a real pleasure to Likewise. have you here. 
Um, thanks everyone for listening. May you go out into the world and engage artistic processes for yourselves. I'm Dr. Cam McComb. This has been Engaging Process.